Hello, everyone. Um, when I was at Al Alvernia University uh, this winter, a uh, very cute little white dog swept me off my feet and into a concrete pillar, so that's why I have to kind of break the TED rules <laughs> today and sit down. Um, I was asked to tell the story of some of the unique experiences in my life. And I will go back 40 years um, to when I was 20 years old, a senior at Drexel, and very much loving uh, college life, loving learning, and not at all wanting to graduate. I was getting some definite signs that the very next world I would be in would not be nearly as supportive as the university had been. The um, counselors were coming in, business people were coming in, and advising the males in the class, the guys, about their next step. None of this for the females. And there had been a very friendly competition between myself and this young man named George um, throughout the whole um, years that I was there. And I ended up being on top, but I only got one award, the Wanamaker Award. All the rest went to George because they were for male only. So I was just hoping that somehow, some way, I would manage to get an OK job that would make all of the really good education I had worthwhile. So it happened then that uh, <clears throat> I did get a job. And as I expected, it was very limited. I was a research assistant. And it wasn't until we moved to Baltimore, my husband had been playing basketball for the Strategic Air Command. And he was going on to Loyola College. And um, I was recruited by Social Security Administration to learn to become a computer programmer. And there, I was back in a very nice world again. I found in that era, the government was um, not as limiting to women as the corporate world would have been. And I got to work on some very pioneering projects, uh, not only for Social Security, but I was loaned out to, to the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory for the first medical diagnostic bank. I got to uh, work with Goddard on the space flight programs. And when I had worked myself up to being on the commissioner's staff, there were two projects that were very near and dear to my heart. One was to get Social Security numbers for everyone at birth because there were hundreds of people sharing the same number. And then also to get um, a program in place that would give women with small children part-time work schedules. So um, this was a very nice era. And then it happened that we came back to Pennsylvania. And uh, for a while, I worked as a system consultant. And ultimately, I had my own firm um, that, I, that was founded with the support of the IBM Corporation. Um, I was humming along, building a very nice business. And then I was alerted by my first partner that he had been approached by Rand Jaslow, who, whose father had been a demonstration site for our software, that they wanted to work against me. Um, they were starting to see the potential of computers. Um, it was for the dental laboratory industry. And they essentially just wanted to sweep it from underneath my feet. They thought they had more money than us and could, could win on that basis. Um, Rand audacious, audaciously uh, wrote to all of our customers and uh, told them he was taking over the business. We learned along the way that he had made a deal with our vice president to steal the source code. And then they brought a trade secret uh, lawsuit against us, asking for millions of dollars because we had stolen their trade secret. And that trade secret was this, that they had been making multiple copies of invoices, and now the computer software could make as many copies of invoices as anyone would, would want. So we thought this was the most preposterous reason for a lawsuit that, you know, this certainly would never be accepted by the courts, but somehow it was. Uh, we think in that era that the courts just did not understand very much about computers or software. Um, so we won at the district level. Then we won at the appellate level. And um, the Jazzles were barred from ever um, marketing dental labs or dental laboratory software. And 
um, the judges determined that they were working with dirty hands. So we thought it was over and done. We were finally, finally finished. And lo and behold, the next thing, they were so determined, their lawyers were so determined, that they took it to the US Supreme Court, and it was accepted as a case. Um, we couldn't believe it, <laughs> whatever. And it went on for over six years. But the courts did determine that copyrights were the proper protection for software. There had been a question on this because software, unlike plays and books and a film even, it's not once and done. It's very often a very dynamic process. It changes with technology. It changes with the needs of business. And so they weren't quite certain whether copyrights were the right thing or what the scope of the protection should be. But it was also uh, came to be determined that it would take over 25 years for software to get its own protection and for the legal system to develop the proper controls there. So copyright became the protection for software. This became the landmark decision in the US. Um, and um, it was a victory not only for us, but for the whole industry. Um, it was during those six years that I came to um, know really the very extreme ends of human behavior. Um, our insurance agent, for example, told his company that um, there was um, this problem that we were having this, this court case going on. And even though we had never had a claim, we always paid our premiums on time. The insurance company terminated our policy, citing that we might burn down our building because we were having these problems. Our bank, our local bank, withdrew our credit lines on the, on the same basis. Uh, although many of our competitors uh, came to our defense, they realized the importance of this to the software industry. One of our competitors went, and always in a hushed voice, went around telling the dental labs that um, they had a secret, um, they had secret knowledge that we couldn't possibly survive the court case and we were about to fail in business and, and they stole quite a bit, you know, they took over quite a bit of the industry at that time. So, um, it was a tough, it was a very tough time. Um, it happened then that the computer industry was exploding and our court case became the most cited case through the 1990s. There were thousands and thousands of articles written about it. It was the case of the year for the American Bar Association. And one of our lawyers urged me to write a book um, about it. And I did not have time. I was running a business to write any kind of um, legal, you know, academic type of treatise on the thing. So I instead directed my efforts towards a book for students. Um, it was called My Mom's Making History. And uh, I'll tell you just, I don't know if the cameras can pick this up or not. It was just a small little handbook, whatever, but it was based on um, an essay our uh, daughter Christy had written when she was a student at Germantown Academy. And it had a lot of wisdom in it. Um, it taught not only about the court case, but also um, she realized that although some people realize they're making history, there are a lot of people that make history and never intend to, and that was certainly us. Um, she pointed out, you know, would Paul Revere know when he was making that ride that students would be studying about him years later? Would um, Washington crossing the Delaware realize that there would be an enactment every year? No, you know, that was not the case at all. But out of, out of this came um, a lot of requests from bar associations, from, from Penn State, from Read Across America, from schools and universities to talk about copyright education. And so most of the time when I'm talking to groups, I'm talking about um, you know, the history of copyrights, the constitutional basis in Article One, Section 8 that is actually there to benefit society um, by promoting creativity, uh, fair use for education, and the concepts of that ideas are not protected by copyright, but expression is co protected by copyright. But what I want to focus on today for my talk is, is not these. You probably get these in your college courses these days. It has come to be that it, it is often taught in colleges. But rather, one very important lesson that I learned, and that was the importance of surrounding myself with good people. Um, the, um, 
by good people, I do not mean particularly um, prestigious people or influential people. Um, you know, they don't have to be smart or rich or famous or anything like that, but simply people who have the courage to stand up for what is right, who, who have good ethics, who will look out for other people, who will support you even when you're struggling. And that became the key to me uh, and my company um, in overcoming our adversity. Um, There, um, lost my train of thought for a moment. <laughs> there too. Um, the um, there were there were several good people on my list um, that uh, really come to mind. One was my first partner. Now he was a fellow who had a reputation for being focused on money and nothing but money, and yet he had the courage to stand up to the Jaslows and say no. Um, he stood by me, he gave me, um, you know, he told the truth, he gave me the support throughout the whole thing. And the other unlikely hero in this whole story was the Internal Revenue Service. We were called in because we had expensed an $89 chair instead of depreciating. it. And um, so I went, you know, to the office as they requested. And at the very end of the um, interview, the IRS agent said to me, you are carrying on the burden for the whole entire computer industry. It's time to go get some help. I was totally startled. Um, on the way home, it started to hit me that this was no longer about just us anymore, about my little company. It was about the whole industry, and it had reached far greater proportions than, than we had ever imagined. Um, so. Um, there were many other people along the way, too. Uh, there were our employees who stood by us. There were our competitors. All the other competitors gave expert testimony in the case. Um, there was, uh, even though our insurance company and our bank were really acting out of very selfish motives, um, there was IBM who had trained me, who had helped me get started in business, and who gave me support with their very best lawyers and with paying the expenses um, on the, and it is very expensive to go through the U.S. Supreme Court. Even the printing costs alone were like over six thousand dollars. So I am very, I was very appreciative of all that, of my family too who supported us throughout the whole thing. Um, Technology is changing at a very rapid stage. Uh, we who are in technology, uh, I think, know this more than anything else. We are discarding old technologies left and right as technology is moving on. I think it behooves all of us, though, to be very mindful of our humanity and to cherish some of what we would call old-fashioned values in people, things like respect and fairness and doing the right thing. Um, the, um, the key to, to so much of this, to so much of our overcoming adversity were the good people who came through for us. And it behooves all of us to continue to, you know, if, we find, if you find the good people as, as I have, to appreciate them, to keep them in your lives if it's appropriate, to let them um, know that you treasure them so that they continue to go on and, and continue with their positive values and um, help other people be willing to help them. Um, it is just so key in the world. Um, after all of this um, was said and done, uh, I went on to write another book. Uh, it was about one of our basketball players, Jameer Nelson. And uh, in the author section of that book, um, I put in uh, a little thing that when I retire someday, I would like to help other people write their stories. It was a process I really enjoyed very much. And I, you know, I'm not retired yet, but I have helped about nine other people with their stories. Um, along the way, I've gotten to meet some extraordinary people and some lots and lots of wonderful everyday people. Um, it's been a wonderful experience. Um, it was a case of making some good out of bad, and 
Uh, I've gotten to do a lot of, um, most of the time I'm uh, heading up a software development firm, but I've also gotten to do some very fun, creative things because of this. I've gotten to be a little bit of a college professor, a little bit of an author. I've been a speaker, a seminar leader. Um, I was even asked to broadcast the Philadelphia Sports Story of the Year because of Tremere. And um, it's, um, and another thing that has happened is also because of the Jumeir book is I've gotten a lot of, this is following the theme of the book, I've gotten a lot of sweaty hugs from uh, young basketball players. Um, as it had happened to, um, there was another case going on when our case, when the Whalen v. Jaslow case was going on, and that was called Apple versus Franklin. And the gist of that case was whether um, the operating systems for computers could be protected by the copyright laws. This did not go all the way to the Supreme Court. It was a settle much earlier. But the Apple people were using the very same lawyers that we were. And then years later, I got a call from Steve Jobs, who gave me support, moral support for, um, for my book and gave me a good quote to put in the book as well. And uh, one thing I learned from that too was that he and Steve Wozniak had a, had a diversion of opinion early on in, in the history of Apple. Steve Wozniak was actually the more creative person early on, but he wanted to give everything away for free. And um, Steve Jobs definitely did not, uh, whatever. And um, if, you know, if Steve Wozniak had won out, we probably wouldn't have your iPads and your iPhones and your iMacs that we have today. So as the years have gone by, um, the um, Memories of the uh, hardships and the struggles are still there, but I know with very strong conviction that I never would have overcome the adversity that, that we have if it had not been for the good people that surrounded me and came to our rescue. I would not have what I have now and um, what I have had along the way if it were not for these people. Um, I love the concept of TED. This is helping to spread good ideas and many of them coming from very, very good people, as you can see today. So I thank them, and I thank all of you for hearing my story.